Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week, EWTN gives me this great privilege to bring into your lives the stories of men and women who were led by the Holy Spirit to discover the beauty and fullness of the church. Often, the journeys are of men and women who make maybe one major jump in their life. They came from one tradition and then discover the beauty of the fullness of the church and then come into the church. Others have a number of traditions in their background, some many, and I think maybe that's the example of our guest tonight. Uh, and you can see in this long journey the Holy Spirit drawing our guest in small steps towards the fullness of the church. Our guest tonight is Mark Averett, former, well, this former Southern Baptist, former Disciples of Christ, but you'll fill us in a few other places, right, Mark? Yes. Welcome to the journey home. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. Yeah, as a as a friend of mine likes to say, I'm a former Methodistical, but <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and even those three Methodist, Baptist, right. Pentecostal are three radically different yeah. traditions. If you really compare what they believe and how how they, but what I normally do in the journey home, and you've seen the program, is I would love for you to start way back, give a little summary of where you come from, so the audience knows you know the the, the radicalness of your journey. Okay. Well, I was, you know, start at the very beginning. I was born in Mississippi in Oxford, better known as Ole Miss, because my parents were both in grad school there at the time. <laughs> and about six months after I was born there, we moved to Jackson, Mississippi. My dad had a job with Lakeside Laboratories, and my sister was born there. And then uh, and when I was four years old, he got a, a better job. We moved briefly to Memphis for a month and lived ne about a block from Elvis. <laughs> and uh, then he got an even better job and we moved to Lexington, Kentucky. And so that's where I grew up. Uh, right. There in the heart of the bluegrass with the horse farms and every place. It was a great place to, to grow up. And my father's dad was a, a Southern Baptist pastor and professor. Uh, oh, so you really came from a solid Southern Baptist environment. Then. Well, on my dad's side, yeah, okay. my mother had uh, started out uh, United Methodist, and then when she and her brother were in their teens, they transferred over to the uh, Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Right. So that was that side. And uh, but I remember growing up Southern Baptist. I have many fond memories of that. Um, you know, church twice on Sundays and Wednesday nights. Yep. Uh, did uh, Royal Ambassadors with the Bible drills, and <laughs> you know, memorized lots of scripture. Uh, uh, got baptized around the age of nine. And, um, uh, you know, for some people that's, you know, you do pastor's class and get baptized. And for some people that's just kind of like a cultural rite of passage, like it is right. for a lot of Catholic kids doing confirmation, unfortunately, yeah. which I've taught a few times. Uh, but in my case, it was very sincere and very real, you know, and I was very excited about it. And by the time I was 12... Would you say then that the bap your baptism experience was a little bit comparable to Catholic confirmation as a time when you are of reason, you've thought it through, you're making a commitment of your life. Yes, I, th I think most, uh, at least as I recall, most Baptist kids were baptized 9 to 12 in there somewhere. Right. You know, you might have a few that when they were very young just really seemed to want it and understand it at, at an appropriate level, the pastor might, you know, it comes down to the pastor's decision, right. you know, as to whether they're ready and really understand it sufficiently. But there is this, when you got to a certain age, you would go through pastor's class. But you wouldn't be yeah. understanding it as a, as we do, not as a sacramental change. No. It's really a statement of faith. Right. And in fact, I mean, uh, later on after I became a disciple of Christ, I, I, uh, learned that, well, actually when I went to seminary with the disciples and had to do the denominational history, the, what became the Southern Baptist and the Disciples of Christ were one denomination or one movement for about 18 years in the early 1800s. Oh, I didn't know that. And they split uh, over the issue of baptismal regeneration. The Baptists said, no, it's just a, just a symbol. It's an outward expression of an inward faith experience, you know, and the disciples said no. They, they read the Bible as saying no, it, it does something. You know, it washes, it really does wash your sins away. You know, and brings in the Holy Spirit. You know, so they, they had, that was kind of the beginning of a, that was my first little bit of a more <laughs> sacramental understanding, didn't understand it that way at the time, you know. Well, you, uh, you had that in a father and a mother then. I mean, was that an issue? Probably wasn't, but. No, 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 not really, because my 
my dad was the stereotypical PK, you know, preacher's kid. And, uh, he went to his grave with issues from that experience. You know. um, but, you know, I mean, my parents raised us in the church. I don't really remember. We didn't pray much as a family other than grace before meals or, you know, uh, you know, maybe a family funeral or funeral of a friend. But, but my mother talked quite often about the importance of faith in her life and, and in general, you know. And, and that was definitely there. And I remember my dad when he was teaching the, the teenagers class in high school. And one of the kids in class uh, who later on became an attorney and <laughs> said, do you really believe this stuff? And he said, well, yes, I do, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, so. Yeah, you know, I think you know my dad. Deep down inside, he he really did believe, but he he had struggled with issues because of. I think he would be the first to support a, a celibate clergy <laughs> because oh. of the experiences that he went through. Right. That he saw the way his dad was treated sometimes. You know, uh, and uh, well, it was a challenge. I mean, yeah. that's why the, it's one of the many reasons that the church. Catholic Church affirms celibacy because there are issues. Uh, now, the other thing I was going to ask is that you went from Mississippi to all those different steps, and none of those were very Catholic oh, environments. No. Oh, no. You know. uh, Did you have contacts with Catholics at all or, or even thoughts about the Catholic Church? Well, I'll get to that in okay. a minute. But right. uh, my first experience of that, but no, I didn't really, you know, not starting out. Um, and my grandfather, like I said, his specialties as a pastor and a professor were biblical Greek and Hebrew. I grew up hearing him speak Greek and Hebrew, you know, during visits and stuff, uh, and church history. But he had a very sectarian view of church history. I still have some of the tracts he wrote about how Peter was never in Rome. The Bible says he was in Babylon. He was in Babylon, you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and things like that, you know. Um, even though Babylon didn't really exist, you know, at that, at that time, you know, so. Um, but, you know, I, I remember, you know, my, my grandparents prayed together every night, and my grandmother would, I mean, till her dying day, she'd live to be 94, would send me these little notes in the mail that she was praying for me with little scriptures or, or ver verses from hymns, you know, and things like that. And uh, it was a very powerful, ex you know, uh, experience and a blessing and and I still remember her saying only one life will soon be passed only what's done for Christ will last which is really a very Catholic expression you know the, the Catholic Church has always encouraged us to uh, meditate regularly or if not daily on the four last things yeah. <laughs> right death judgment heaven and hell and uh, so that's essentially what she was saying in a slightly maybe less morbid way <laughs> a little yeah. bit more poetic but uh, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I think if you remember that and make it your motto, you'll do pretty exactly, well. Exactly, exactly. You know? um, so anyway, uh, grew up Southern Baptist, uh, was in the Boy Scouts at the Baptist church I grew up in. And, uh, and then we, when I was 12, um, the pastor at the church left, and my parents really did not like the fellow who took his place. And... Um, so that's when we decided to go to the Disciples of Christ Church. Um, it was a large, you know, downtown Disciples Church. It's a fact, in fact, kind of like the mother church of that whole oh. movement. Uh, oh, wow. The Campbell Stone debates that took place in the area, uh, the congregation that was kind of formed around those is the congregation that I went to mm -hmm. under a different name and a few blocks away from the original location, you know. So very historic church and uh, very liberal. I didn't realize I it when say, I was young. But, uh, I was going to ask that because yeah. when you think of churches, uh, disciples of Christ, the Christian church, I mean the range that you can have, and especially that's one of the oldest, in my mind, often it tends to be the more liberal. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Well, and of course it's kind of sad they started out uh, very yeah. vehemently saying we are not a denomination. You know, we are a movement to restore the unity of the ancient and the simplicity of the ancient church. And they called themselves the Restoration Movement because they said the Reformers didn't go far enough. The Reformation took, kept too much Catholic stuff, you know, and we're just going to toss it all out. And, you know, the maxim is where the Scriptures speak, we speak. Where the Scriptures are silent, we are silent. Which, unfortunately, when you throw out all of those lessons the church learned the hard way for all those centuries is why you find... I found a lot of folks that, you know, 
deny things like the Trinity, yeah. you know, because that word's not in Scripture. And so it's like, you know, if you're really going to take that very literally, I mean, obviously the, tri the Trinity can be found in Scripture, but that word isn't. Right. You know, so they fall into the same errors that the Arians fell into and whatnot. And uh, it's like, you know, gee, do we really have to go through all that again? <laughs> um, but, but you do. You open that can of worms. You end up having to go through it again. If you're going to throw out tradition, I mean, that's what you're saying, right? And, you know, of course, they, they were such a young denomination or movement at that time, at the time of the Civil War, that along with the Catholics and the Anglicans, I think they were the only ones that didn't split <laughs> during the Civil War. Uh, their split came about 50 years later in the early 1900s because their churches in the South were, had suffered through the oppression that came after the Civil War with, you know, Union officials standing in their churches on Sundays to make sure they weren't going to try to stir things up again. And the folks, the congregations up north were prospering. Yeah. They had organs and, you know, nice decorations and whatnot, you know, and, and that became the symbol. It's like, well, you know, no, the, that's where the non-instrumental churches of Christ came from. Oh. oh they they kind of wondered... saw that as symbolic of, okay. you know, that these people are not treating us well. And so uh, they split off then. And then in 1968, as the, what remained of the disciples of Christ became increasingly liberal, uh, then you had the, the independent Christian churches and churches of Christ split off, uh, which there's one of their, a very huge, huge Southland Christian church in the Lexington area is just enormous. Their original thing, and they're an independent one, and they just bought an old mall in Lexington as to set up as, a, as another congregation, and it's just huge, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, the Disciples of Christ, um, to, to try to forge all of these different denominations together as one group, they chose uh, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, you know, as what was going to bind them together. And so they celebrate the Lord's Supper every week, you know. If you go out to a more rural disciples church, um, they tend to be much more conservative, and you really would be hard-pressed to tell them from Baptists. Hmm in terms of their style of worship and whatnot, also congregational system of church government, right. except that they receive, they do celebrate the Lord's Supper every week. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, that was kind of a move towards the sacramental a little bit. And also, as I learned in seminary later on, uh, which I never got this in my congregation, but as I learned in seminary, kind of they're, they're just a, but you know, in my congregation, you know, the pastor kind of would, when we got to that point, the pastor would kind of introduce now, you know, the, the beginning of celebrating the Lord's Supper, and then it was handed over to the laity in the church. Hmm. And they kind of did the readings and the prayers and the distribution, and the pastor just sat there. Because the reasoning behind it is, because they said, you know, Jesus, yeah. you know, it's Jesus who is here in spirit inviting you to the table. And so you have to decide for yourself whether you should go. That's between you and the Lord. And they were probably the first group to practice open communion, you know. And uh, uh, which is a good point because people are always critical of the Catholic Church for having a closed communion. But it used to be everybody was. Oh, well, the Baptists certainly communion. were, but it's yeah. not closed communion. That's another thing. It's close communion. We celebrate communion with those who are close to us in faith and practice. <laughs> it's not closed like you're not welcome. And that's no. a, that's a that's yeah. a it's close communion, you know. <laughs> Um, and but a very Catholic understanding yeah. of like this is supposed to mean that we are one body in Christ that we share our lives in communion not just with God but with each other that we are one body we believe the same things we live the same way we've made conscious choices around those things and to celebrate communion with people who have very different beliefs and practices is kind of making a lie of it you know, they don't, certainly don't have that sacramental understanding of this is truly the body and blood of Christ. They don't believe that. But, uh, but that part of it is very Catholic, you know. Uh, a good friend who's been on the program before, Bruce Sullivan, who was a former Church of Christ pastor, said, I wish I could remember the exact term, but he said that another part of Disciples of Christ was, yes, it's, if it is Scripture, in, yes, and if it ain't, it's not. But he said there was a rule. It was like a way of interpreting scripture. Isn't that a part of the disciples of Christ? That there was a, it was like a tradition on how you interpret scripture, how you approach scripture. Well, if there was, I don't Your branch know. didn't get it, okay. <laughs> no, except that just like, uh, if, if the scriptures, 
where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the yeah. scriptures are silent, we are silent is all that I heard. And basically, you know, uh, and, yeah. that, and, that, and that was to try to avoid, to minimize those differences because the disciples started on the frontier in Kentucky mm-hmm. and trying to, well, actually, you know, you had two different members, two different Scottish Presbyterian pastors, Campbell and Stone, who were uh, yeah. both headed in the same direction. They met in these debates and, and realized, yes, we are basically saying the same things and decided, you know, because they're trying to make the unity of the early church come back, so let's make one group. But it wasn't a good, neither group would give up its name. One was the Christian church, one was the disciples of Christ. It became the Christian church, parentheses, disciples of Christ. <laughs> so that, that didn't bode well, you know. But, <laughs> but um, So you were training yourself in seminary? Well, that's... Well, I'll get okay. back to that in a minute, but right. uh, I know I go, I chase my tail around on these things. But um, so that was the kind of the beginning of a sacramental understanding, you know, a little bit there. You know, mm-hmm. the, but the sense that Jesus is truly present; He's the one who's inviting you to come to His table. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't transfiguration, but Tra- it was saying, you know, Jesus right. is uh, trans, yeah, excuse me, transubstantiation. But it, but Jesus is really there, and He's yeah. really calling you to come to communion. You know, um, and then the other one was while I was in a, a um, youth group. While I was in youth group there, for whatever reason, our, our uh, I love him to death. Our youth minister there, who was not your typical youth minister. I mean, he was in his forties at the time. You know, <laughs> uh, he took us to Gethsemane Abbey for vespers, uh, which is where Thomas Merton was right. a monk, Trappist right. Monastery in Bardstown, Kentucky. Uh, they were near Bardstown. Um, and it was like December, January when it's dark by 530. And back then you couldn't sit downstairs. You had to sit up in the balcony in the church. And so we get up there before Vespers. It's dark. You know, there's no, not even a moon that night. You know, it's dark and the only light is the sanctuary lamp. Like a And it's a very austere sanctuary. Very austere. Very long. Yeah. And other than the exit light over the door, <laughs> you know, there was the sanctuary lamp way down there by the altar, and that was it, you know. And then the bells began to toll, and the monks come in, you know, holding candles, you know, uh, two lines. Black, aren't they black robed? Well, With, black and white. Uh, yeah, black and white, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The robe is white, and the, the scapular is uh, right. kind of black. And, um, but two lines with candles filed into their choirs and began this antiphonal chanting. And I was like, wow, this is different. You know? <laughs> um, and it really was my first, ex- because the Baptist and the disciples are in their exterior so similar, it really was my first realization that there was any way of being Christian other than what I knew. I mean, I was, I was that naive about such things up to right. that point. And it was like, you know, I can look back and see that as kind of a little nudge in that direction. Certainly there was no awareness of that at the time, but it just really was, gee, you know, there's... There's especially, other ways of being a Christian and kind of follow that back there. Well, know. especially what I'm anticipating or, or guessing was your perception of the Catholic Church in that environment is that that may seem real strange to you, even wondering it was a little bit... Well, it was really strange, strange but yeah. I liked it. Oh, okay. It was, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. I liked it, you know. Um, but again, you know, that's what was, where I was at. So it was yeah. a, a neat experience and I kind of followed away, you know, and, and went on, you know. Um, and as I said, I'd been very fervent about my faith, uh, but unfortunately, um, in high school, I kind of started to fall into the whole drug, sex, and rock and roll hmm. culture. Uh, also, unfortunately, at that time, you know, my father uh, lost his very good corporate job, and our family went through real severe financial reversals. Um, we had to sell our family home, sell all of our cars except one. Hmm move into an apartment. My mother had been a stay-at-home mom, had to go back to work. You know, it took my dad a year to find a, another decent job, you know. Mm. An experience that a lot of people these days have right. plenty of sympathy or empathy for, you know, yeah. um, with the economy the way it's been. Uh, and so they were very, their plates were full and they were very distracted with uh, just trying to keep body and soul together and figure out how are we going to get through this mess. And they didn't, uh, because of that, didn't really realize what was going on with me, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and somebody did raise a concern one time, and I lied through my teeth and said, no, no, I'm not doing any of those things. <laughs> like I said, they were busy, so that was kind of the end of that, you know. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I was full, full, you know, not right off the bat, but, you know, over the course of the next few years, I did get 
kind of full tilt into that whole culture and whatnot, mm-hmm. and uh, on into college. It was about nine years in mm-hmm. that whole experience, and uh, briefly for a few months, right about in the middle of that, I came back to the Lord and then fell back into it. Mm-hmm. Um, lived with three guys in a house, you know, on campus, you know, the last couple of years I was in college and our house was party central, you know. Um, and uh, then after I didn't live with them anymore, I moved into an apartment by myself. The only time I'd ever lived by myself, which was, uh, I enjoyed that. I mean, I enjoyed living with my roommates, but I enjoyed that too. It was a different experience. And uh, I kind of had a Damascus Road experience. Um, I, I was, uh, had been out partying the night, Saturday night, the night before. Came home at 3 o'clock in the morning, intoxicated on various things, and uh, fell into the bed. And I never did quit going to church. I never formally renounced my faith. I would still go to, to church at the Disciples Church about every four to six weeks, but more of a social thing, just to see everybody that I knew, my old youth group buddies, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. This particular Sunday morning, um, it's like I was literally awakened by a desire to go to church sat bolt upright in the bed (laughs) (laughs) with this desire to go to church. Um, And normally with what I'd done the night before, I'd have thought, oh, it's too early. I haven't had enough sleep. I'm going back to sleep. Maybe next week, you know. But the Lord woke me up with that bolt uh, when I just had just barely enough time to get to church if I got up right then and went, and I didn't even think about it. I got out of bed. I got ready, and I went. And uh, I don't remember anything the preacher said that day. I don't remember any hymns that we sung. But as soon as that service started, the Holy Spirit was on me like the proverbial hound of heaven. <laughs> and thank God for the Baptist. All those scriptures I'd memorized, <laughs> you know, he started pulling them out of the recesses of my memory and shoving them in my face and rubbing my nose and saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? You know, you know you're not, you're not living right. You know, and really, the last couple of years of that uh, that whole experience, I, I felt like I was dying. And I wasn't didn't have any disease or physically, but I just felt like I was dying. You know, in the in the the worst sort of way. You know, the spiritual death. Um, and as liberal as that church was, they still did an altar call. <laughs> 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 and, and I was raised, you know, my Southern Baptist, you know, once the service started, I, you know, no, no matter what, I was just, it was just rude to get up and walk out in the middle of a worship service. So I sat there, the Holy Spirit had me for a good hour. And by the end, I was whipped and I was down that aisle and I took the microphone. I gave my life back to the Lord and that was that and I never looked back. So <laughs> um, within a, less than a year, I really felt like the Lord was telling me to go to Lexington Theological Seminary. Which at that time, I, I, some people told me that it's in danger of closing. Their, mm-hmm. their uh, enrollment's down so far. I don't know how true that is. But uh, I think that was probably the main seminary for the disciples at that time. I was time. wondering if it was denominated <coughs> the disciples. <coughs> Excuse me. I was there from, I started in the spring, so it was January of 84 till uh, the beginning of 85. And... Uh, and I went, you know, I went in, and I had no desire to be a pastor, but the Lord was telling me to go there. So I went in to talk to our pastor about going as a Timothy of the of the church, you know, of the congregation. And uh, he really shocked me because we were talking about this and that. We got onto the subject of our Christology, and at one point he looked me straight in the eye and he said, "Christ was not divine." And I was just, I mean, I was literally speechless. I was so shocked I didn't know what to say. Huh. Um, and the, con- the conversation ended shortly after that. But <laughs> uh, from that point on, I started to listen to his sermons much more closely for, I mean, as liberal as that congregation was, he couldn't say that from the pulpit and get away with it. Yeah. You know? But I started to listen much more for what he didn't say than for what he did say. And the preaching was had always been much more about Christ as our good example and... Yeah. Lots of quotes from Harry Emerson Fosdick, <laughs> who's one of his favorites, you know. But, uh, um, and then I went to the seminary and I enrolled. And uh, the dean uh, asked me, "Why are you here?" I said, "I have no idea, except the Lord told me to come." He said, "Okay." <laughs> so to his credit, that was good enough. Um, I spent a year there. Was the seminary of the mindset of your pastor? Yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah, much. I was, I was um, wondering. I mean, I hate to label any good school. Well, he was a graduate. 
yeah. of that school too. Yeah. He was a native Lexington. Well, no, actually, he was from Maysville. Uh, but uh, anyway, but well, certainly yeah. not everybody. Right. Not all right. the faculty. But again, right. the, where the scriptures will speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. Um, I heard classmates and even some of my professors uh, at least openly questioning and sometimes ridiculing, you know, things that I always understood to be kind of central tenets of Christianity, regardless of what group you're in, which is the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, the inspiration and infallibility of Scripture, oh. you know. And there's a small group of us more orthodox students that would meet regularly in the second floor student lounge going, oh my God, did you hear what <laughs> Professor so-and-so said today? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, scandalized terribly. I mean, really, yeah. truly were, you know. It was fairly traumatic, you know, but um, I was, uh, I really tried to give them an open hearing, I really tried to understand where they were coming from and to, to be objective as possible in response to this. And I was living with my roommate, I had a roommate again living in the Transylvania Presbytery building as a caretaker. <laughs> and my roommate eventually came my brother-in-law. <laughs> um, and I would come home and tell him what I was, uh, what I was, uh, he was working on becoming an RN, and, you know, and I was going to the seminary. I already had my bachelor's degree in social work from UK, University of Kentucky, and so then I would tell them what I was hearing in seminary and, and trying to explain where they were coming from because that's where I was trying to really understand where they were coming from. And I was doing such a good job of being objective, he was really worried about me. <laughs> he really <laughs> thought I was going down that path, but I wasn't. Um, at the end of the year, the Lord told me to leave, just like he had told me to go. Uh, but when I left, I... My faith was really much more my own. And it wasn't just what my family had given me, you know, or my congregation had given me. I had had to uh, wrestle with the angel through the night, you know, um, and work these things out, you know, as uh, as I listened to their side of it. And at the end of that year, I came out pretty much where I had started on those core things of the faith. But I mean, I I had gained some benefits too um, from. Uh, a little bit more of a sacramental understanding, even though it's their congregation but system. It's only you had to even fight a few battles to defend what you believed to oh, be true. I certainly did. Yeah. And uh, I also, of course, got my one advantage to them being a more liberal school. If I'd gone to Louisville Southern Baptist, I'd have gotten a very sectarian treatment of church history like my grandfather got. Probably not as much as he got in his day, but still. <laughs> Because uh, back then was when the Baptists were really fighting their own fight about yeah. are we going to stay conservative or are we going towards the more liberal end, you know. Um, Disciples of Christ, because they were more liberal, I got a pretty balanced, objective treatment of church history. Hmm. You know, just like this is what happened. You know, you decide for yourself what that means for the most part. It was kind of surprising, but I did. And that was good. <laughs> and I got, my, I got my first introduction to the early church fathers. <laughs> Which I know you've heard this this story from lots of people, you know. In fact, we're going to pause okay. there because I think that's usually a first step in the direction toward the church, I'm guessing. Yes. We'll just pause there because it's time for a break, Mark. So why don't okay. we, we'll leave you with early church fathers and we'll come back after break to see what you discovered for probably the first time you ever heard an early church father, right? Definitely. Definitely. Okay, we'll come back to that. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grody, your host. Our guest tonight is Mark Averett, and uh, former Southern Baptist, Disciples of Christ. Uh, we haven't hit the Methodist stage uh, yet, that's right? A, that's but, about to start. But yeah. you're, you were introduced to the early church fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good place to stop because a lot of people, that's the start of the journey. Right. And uh, so, yes, we 
had to get, we got introduced to the early church fathers and we had to uh, uh, pick one and write a paper about them. I picked uh, St. Gregory Nazianzen, <laughs> one of the champions against the Arian heresy yeah. and the great writer about Our Lady. And, uh, and I was reading the writings of the early church fathers and you know, I didn't know that much about the Catholic Church yet. I, I knew enough. I'm reading this and I said, man, these guys sound awfully Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> And again, you know, uh, at the time, that didn't make me think, okay, i got to become a Catholic. But looking back, I definitely see the influence. Mm -hmm. You know, again, just kind of like Vespers at Gethsemane Abbey. Like, you know, there's, there's other possibilities out there, you know, and, and I wasn't quite ready to go intently looking, but it was still a, a big nudge, probably the first big nudge in that direction. Yeah, in your more liberal environment where they're mm -hmm. saying, okay, this is history, this is what happened, decide for yourself. That was just one of the things that happened in history. You know, whether you take it seriously now is a different issue or not. But I guess, and again, subconsciously, I guess, because I had been trying to be objective, listening to where these guys were coming from, uh, and they were so challenging so many things that I thought were central to the Christian faith, you know, then to hear these very ancient church leaders saying those, affirming those things that are so central to the Christian faith, fighting for them, giving their lives for them, you know. Yeah. Uh, Especially really, Our Lady, I'm wondering, well, how did that affect you at the time with his? his uh, well, not, not really, you know, not at the time, not much. And I never really had, I didn't know enough about what Catholics thought about Mary for that really be a big issue for me at the yeah. time, you know. Okay. But, uh, um, <laughs> but it, in terms of, okay if everything's up for grabs, you know, but then here's these guys way back there at the very beginning, yeah. and they're saying those things. So it was probably, I didn't have any concept of sacred tradition at the time, but it, it kind of made me, hmm. it, it was sacred tradition. It made me think, okay, well, there, maybe there is a source outside of sacred scripture or, alongside, or alongside of sacred scripture, I should probably say, that would help with uh, yeah. deciding, okay, what's the right interpretation and what isn't. Didn't really, again, didn't really realize that at a conscious level at the time, but it, it was a seed that was planted, yep. you know. So uh, about uh, after a year, like I said, the Lord told me to leave. And uh, I came out of there again, pretty much where I had started on those, those core orthodox issues of Christianity that all Christians hold in common to truly be called Christian. Um, but on, I gained some things like introduction to those other 1,500 years that Protestants never talk about outside of seminary. <laughs> right. and, and sometimes even then don't talk about them a whole lot. Um, and also uh, the social teaching or implications of the gospel, which of course they were very big on. You know, I mean, uh, there were some big fans of the whole uh, liberation theology movement at that seminary and inclusive language. Yeah. Uh, because the disciples were also, I think, the first denomination to ordain women. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, those were big issues as, uh, there, you know. But at the end of the year, um, and I was never really big into those things, but I mean, the, the more, the things would be more in line with Catholic social teaching. You know, that the, yes, our primary duty is to preach the gospel and make disciples, but it's important to as, as Zig Ziglar likes to say, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, you know, <laughs> that you have to minister to the whole person, yeah. you know. Uh, and if you're meeting people's physical needs and their emotional needs, they're probably going to listen to your preaching of, you know, the gospel a little, a little more, you know, be more open and receptive to that, you know. So I did bring, come away f with more of an understanding and appreciation for that aspect, and that was a good thing. Uh, and so at the end of that year, I knew I couldn't stay in the Disciples of Christ anymore. I didn't just leave the seminary. I left the denomination. Mm -hmm. uh, but where to go? The big question, you know. So uh, living with my former roommate, now brother-in-law, he's still going to the U.K. working on his uh, master's degree in nursing. And he had gotten into the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship yeah. at U.K. And uh, so I started, he invited me, and I started going to some meetings with him. And a math professor taught a morning Bible study once a week in the Patterson Office Tower at UK. And just a phenomenal man. At that time, you know, 
my grandfather and grandmother's side and whatnot, you know, because uh, they weren't on campus. Uh, he was the uh, most godly, holy, sincerely practicing his faith man that I knew. And he happened to be going to Christ United Methodist Church, which was a, a new congregation in that denomination. Um, and the pastor was Danny Philpot, whose father was Ford Philpot. I don't know if that, he's kind of like the Methodist Billy Graham. <laughs> the Ford Philpot Evangelistic Association in Kentucky was uh, never as big as Billy Graham's organization, but pretty big for the, on the local scene. Yeah. And he did the evangelistic revivals and tent meetings and all that kind of thing. And uh, so we started attending there and, uh, and Sam's sister, young, uh, one of his one of his three sisters, my wife Kathy, started attending at the same time that uh, we did. <laughs> and uh, she had just been going through a divorce uh, from a, her first marriage. And they were, they're 100% Sicilian, raised Catholic in, in the Metro Detroit area. Second generation, you know, my wife's second generation American, so she was raised Catholic, but had uh, kind of fallen away from the faith for a time, as did one of her older brothers, Mike. And uh, he went to Asbury, okay. and so he kind of conservative Methodist, right? right. Uh, yeah, Wesleyan, I guess. Most right. of them are there. Wesleyan Armenian theology, but right. most of them there are Methodist, but they right. have quite right. a few. Uh, and so Mike, uh, they had kind of a charismatic revival movement that burst out at Asbury at the time that Mike was there. I don't know if you're familiar with that no. or not, but that did happen. And they had they had this little revival meeting on campus that ended up stretching for months. See, I don't picture that happening at Asbury, but... Yes, uh, it did. <laughs> well, I said, one Pentecostal, but it's, it was more in line with the old Wesleyan tradition of the second blessing, okay. you know, okay. and uh, just this outbreak of the Holy Spirit. Um, a rose by any other name smells as sweet, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, and so he really became on fire for it. He was one of the ones who'd kind of had some influence leading them away from the Catholic Church, but then he also, because of that, started leading them back into Christianity. Mm -hmm. And then, and Mike, you know, actually uh, stayed Catholic, you know, in the end, and, you know, his whole life long. So, uh, till the end, he, he died uh, last year, so, um, unfortunately from cancer. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Kathy started, she was going through a divorce, and they had a divorce support group there. And so her uh, counselor had suggested that she go. So we all ended up going to the, that church at the same time. And uh, we ended up falling in love and getting married. You know, I could say lots more about that story, but this is, that's not really the story that we're here for. So, <laughs> But anyway, she is the love of my life, you know, and... Uh, uh, we got married there, and then the, the fall, we got married in March, and, the, and that fall we went on the walk to Emmaus, which is a uh, Protestant ecumenical version of the Curcio movement in the right. Catholic Church. Right. Uh, so, you know, of course the Methodists have their Book of Discipline, you know, much more liturgical prayers for things like baptism and confirmation and whatnot. I mean, they had confirmation, you know, which was different, you know. Um, which is a... Uh, you know, a, a trajectory of the Anglican book right. of prayer. I mean, that's... Well, and, and the three pastors I had that while I was there, uh, Danny Philpot and then Terry Ferris, were more low church Methodists okay. and very much evangelistic. And I mean, actually doing evangelism explosion out there door to door and everything. And, uh, and then we had uh, Howard Reynolds after him, who was much more high church Methodist, and he was one of the tobacco Reynolds. And he had uh, kind of renounced that whole family legacy and fortune and felt called to be a Methodist minister. And uh, just a, a very godly man, though. He had a pastor's heart, you know, a real pastor's heart. Um, so I had, that was my first kind of more immersed experience of a more liturgical church tradition. And then the walk to Emmaus with its big emphasis on, of course, it wasn't the Eucharist, but, you know, right. the, it's still, you had, the walk centered around these 15 talks and this series of very special celebrations of the Lord's Supper in a way different than you ever really did it in church to some degree, you know, because yeah. uh, it was a very powerful weekend experience. Um, but part of that is, you know, we got all these Christia, we got these agape letters from all these other yeah. uh, Emmaus communities and Catholic Curcio communities. 
And some of these letters we got from these CO communities said, you know, we're praying you for, for you on your weekend, and this weekend we've, we've got people we've offered this many masses, this many rosaries, this many novenas. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I still didn't know that much about the Catholic Church, but I knew enough to say, man, that's a mess of praying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a whole lot of prayer, um, and that again, one of just not a huge push, but had an impact, you know. One of those little things, another nudge in that holy nudge in that direction. Uh, so four years with the Methodists, and uh, during that time, I've always been involved outside of just the congreg congregational level. You know, I went to meetings at larger levels, went to a training in Boston at one point. Um, I came, became, a, and I've always read denominational press. You know, and I really became aware of how liberal the the, the Methodists yeah. were, because yeah. I ended wide up going, range, wide, right. wide range. Yeah. The only reason I started going to a Methodist church was because this professor went there and I thought, you know, this is a very deeply holy spiritual man. If he's going to this church, something has to be going on there. You know, that's where he was going. So I thought, okay, well, I've got to go somewhere. I don't have no clue where to go, so I'll go there. So that's how I ended up with the Methodists. Um, and I did pull away a lot, a lot of good from there. But after four years, I felt like I couldn't stay there any longer for largely the same reasons I didn't feel, I felt like I couldn't stay with the disciples anymore. And, uh, and your wife had been with you during that whole time right. in the Methodist Church. Right. right. Um, and so then the question, okay, now where? Well, I decided to try out the Southern Baptists again because it hadn't been my, I had many fond memories of them. It hadn't been my choice to leave them. Right. That was a choice my parents made, and I felt I owed it for all they had given me as a child, you know, the, all that ammunition they gave the Holy Spirit and the, that Damascus Road experience, yeah. <laughs> and my grandfather. You know, respect for my grandfather. I thought I'd owed it to them to uh, to uh, give them another look, an adult look. So we went to First Baptist in Lexington, which was kind of the mother church of all the older, larger Baptist, Southern Baptist congregations in Lexington. But they had, it was uh, dying out at that point, this huge, enormous stone church and had average at Sunday attendance of 130. And that's those are other stories that we really don't have time for. But uh, uh, enjoyed my four years there. You know, became a deacon there, um, and 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 a lot of Baptist church. The deacon board is the ones who really run things. But <laughs> our pastor there, who had been an associate pastor at Christ United Methodist, and went and became a Baptist pastor at uh, this church, which is one reason we chose to go there because we knew him. Um, doing evangelism explosion there, and he, he was big on discipleship ministry. He had our deacons. Uh, we didn't run the church at all. There was a board of elders, which Baptists usually don't have. That. Mm -hmm. controlled most of the money and made those decisions. The only money our deacon board had control of was the benevolence fund. And he split the congregation up in, a, in, in the same number of pieces as we had deacons, and each of us had a, our portion of the congregation that we were to kind of watch over. And you're supposed to get to know your people, and you know if they you hadn't seen them in a couple of Sundays, you give them a call, make sure everything's okay, and try to meet people's... Uh, earthly needs if needed, you know, and things like that. So I really did enjoy that, yeah. you know. Certainly had an influence on me being on the diaconate program with the Catholic Diocese of saying, Lexington it's, now. it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, let, don't let people slip through the cracks, especially right. big Catholic churches. You know, right. Like no, it was a very yeah. good idea. Yeah. I mean, there's some, place, some congregations that did shepherding ministry that kind of went too far in a, yeah. in a direction, became too controlling, but he did, this was just right. You know, yeah. just getting to know people, Truly caring about them, meeting their needs, you know, mm -hmm. realizing when they weren't there, and finding out if there was a, a bad reason why, you know. Um, and during that whole time, you know, starting out with the Methodists, you know, after all those seeds had been planted for us, starting out with the Methodists, and then even more intently with the Baptist. And during this time, I, well, over the years, even back when I came back to the Lord briefly during the middle of those nine years. I was kind of trying out some charismatic groups and whatnot, you know, and, and still kind of check that out and kind of consider myself a charismatic, you know, um, even within the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, but especially the Baptists, and it really got intense about seeking. All the groups that I had never actually belonged to, I studied. You know, what do they teach and why? Um, non other Non-Christian religions included. You know, um, and so um, at one point I kind of 
talked to my wife about this a little bit, and she wasn't real open to it at that time. You know, <laughs> she didn't say no, but it's like you know, I, I wasn't far enough along to want to push the issue, so I just kept studying. And uh, then by the end of our four years at the Southern Baptist, you know, well, it became the end of our four years because I just decided I was convinced I really needed to become a Catholic. Hmm. I had been. Uh, and I guess to back up just a little bit, uh, after I after I left the seminary, um, that was January of uh, eighty five, and in January of eighty six, I started with the Kentucky Department of Social Services. I was working downtown Lexington, and back then they still had the Catholic churches open, and sometimes I would stop in those churches to pray just because they were open. Mm -hmm. And I would sense the Lord's presence there in a way I never sensed it anywhere before, you know, or anywhere else. Uh, and I was like, you know, what is that? <laughs> yeah. um, and one of these churches had a literature rack of literature that was either free or a quarter, you know, little pamphlets. And I started picking those up and reading them. And for the, for the first time, I let the Catholic Church speak for itself <laughs> instead of listening to what other non-Catholics said about the Catholic Church. Right. You know, and so for the first time, I read their teachings about the Eucharist. I was like, "Oh, well, that's what that is," you know. And <laughs> and being a good Baptist boy who'd read my Bible, you know, and really liked Scripture, I'd always had trouble with John chapter six. You know, what do you do with John chapter six? And no preachers ever preached on John chapter six. You know, <laughs> um, and then it's like, okay, well, now John chapter six makes sense when I look at that. So those experiences with the Eucharist long before I was a Catholic were a huge push in that direction, you know. And those little pamphlets addressed other issues too, sure. like you know, a, a, a hierarchical system of church government and the concept of authority in the church. That you know, this real authority that that keeps people from going where all these folks at Lexington Theological Seminary had been going. You know, uh, that's that role of sacred tradition, um, Our Lady, you know, various yeah. devotions. Communion of the you Saints, know. I'm sure, was yes. a big issue. Cause uh, yeah, it didn't really bother me so much. Right. But, uh, you know, um, this is more of the theological issues for me, although. Um, so, you know, here I was a Baptist deacon, and I decided to make this move. So I wrote a letter to my brother deacons and sent it to them a couple of weeks before our next deacons meeting so they had time to read it and when we had our meeting and they were very they were very polite and cordial you know they had, they had read it and understood it they didn't agree with it but you know there was no no rancor no name calling or finger pointing but yeah we all agreed that i needed to go wherever else the lord might be leading me at that point you know so uh we started going to St. Luke's Catholic Church in Nicholasville and and that was in May um, my wife got her annulment very quickly because it was a defective form case and she had been raised and confirmed Catholic and in her first marriage had married outside the church. Very, you know, very, uh, very quick case. And so uh, we got uh, remarried at the end of June and our daughter, who was two at that time, got baptized the next day. And then that fall I went through RCIA and uh, came into the church at Easter Vigil of 93. Was your RCA a good experience? Um, oh, very good experience. Yeah, Father Bush is renowned in the area as a very uh, uh, traditional, you know, no-nonsense kind of a priest. He, we, we hear, have sermons on the church's teachings about artificial contraception and abortion and homosexuality and all those things on a regular basis. He's had death threats because of that, one of which actually rose to the level of reporting it to the FBI. Uh, on the issues of homosexuality, and that was about 10 years ago before things got to the point really where we're at point. now. Yeah. And uh, never saying hateful or rancorous things, just saying, you know, that that is disordered behavior. It's, yeah. you know, gravely sinful. We need to love the sinner, but hate the exactly. sin. You know, all those things that the church has ever taught, right. you know, and yet, which, you know, which our culture seems to be forgetting today. A oh, terrible right. vitriolic response yeah. from some parties. You know. What would you say would have been the the key thing that drew you then as you look back all, all over your whole journey and now you're Catholic? At, what would you say when you look back? Well, the Eucharist, the Eucharist. Is, is one of those things. Uh, history, because I come from a long line of historians. My father loved history. My grandfather taught history. But, um, and, you know, learning those other 1,500 years that the Protestants never talk about, and especially the early church fathers. 
and the whole issue of authority. Yeah. You know, I mean, Southern Baptists are big on the doctrine of eternal security. You know, once that saved, always saved, and along with that, having an assurance of your salvation. Um, and I have to say, I have more security of my in my salvation as a Catholic than I ever had as a Protestant. And as I as I I teach RCA, I have taught it for I guess about sixteen years uh, as the RCI coordinator and Father Bush and I teach it together. Huh. And we do a very because we have the Asburys in our in our parish, you know, they're in our county. And more years than not, we have had Asbarians in our classes. And those people ask detailed hard questions sure. and they want detailed hard answers. So we have to do a little <laughs> bit more uh, academic doctrinal approach to RCIA than some parishes might, you know. And, uh, uh, but the, the, I always teach the class, you know, that the, the church rests on this three-legged stool of authority, sacred scripture, sacred teach, uh, tradition, and the magisterium. And when anybody comes forward and says, this is the teaching of Christ and his church, if you don't have a threefold testimony from those three sources of authority saying that, yeah, that's right, then it's not right, yeah. you know. And, you know, as I point out to people, you know, Protestants, they're, so, they're really ultimately their source of authority for what they believe is their own opinion. They will say, you know, oh, I believe what the Bible teaches, but you've got over 30,000 different Protestant denominations, each one claiming to be led by the Holy Spirit and in interpreting Scripture, only going by what Scripture teaches, and all teaching and practicing different things. So ultimately, what they're really resting their eternal salvation on is their opinion mm -hmm. of what Scripture teaches. Yeah, and your journey is an experience of what that uh, lack of authority leads to in your Disciples mm -hmm. of Christ, the different Southern Baptists. You know, you go to your seminary, which is the wide breadth of opinions, and the Methodist, complete wide breadth of opinions. We have an email, which and it's a good one. George from PA writes, as a recent convert, I am appalled at how many Catholics hardly know the Bible. How can we get more Catholics to go deeper into the Scriptures? Uh, well, I think that has to, I mean, certainly people like you know, we should uh, encourage, encourage, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. You know, you can start Bible studies in your home, you know, or in your parish. Father Bush, as long as there's nothing wrong with the church, the church has no problem with it, which obviously scripture study they wouldn't. He's like, he's always, you come, you want to do it, you do it. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. uh, but Bible study, I think parish Bible studies is a great thing. We've started, uh, you've had uh, uh, the Catholic Way Bible study. You know, yep. on here that that started in our diocese and is a great program. Um, I was thinking even of your own example. You said during your own Damascus Road experience, it was because of the memorized verses mm -hmm. that were already within you that the Lord could use to challenge you. This speaks to the need for Catholics to right. start memorizing Scripture again as a part of their walk. Well, and uh, and of course, one of our the big pushes of our current Holy Father, you know, Pope Benedict, has yep. been Lectio Divina. And that's a very personal, I think that's, and I think that's brilliant on his part, because that really is a very personal approach to learning Scripture. It's not, you know, certainly if you want to dig into the academics and the Bible, the, you know, the, the sources and get all into all that, that can enrich it. But ultimately it's like praying with the Scripture. When something jumps out at you, you know, you say, okay, I think the Lord's trying to tell me something here. You stop, you spend some time with the Lord on that. It's like, okay, Lord, what are you saying? Take a little time to write some of that down, you know, and then try to live it out, you know, until for the, you know, from that point on. Uh, and lots of Protestants would say, yeah, that's the way you, yep. <laughs> you do Scripture, you know. Yep. Um, and very ancient, one of the most ancient practices in the church that the, the Pope is trying to get people to return to. Um, so I think, you know, working with our Holy Father to repopularize yeah. Lectio Divina and, and lots of Protestants are, lots of lay people, more and more lay people are picking up uh, the divine office too. And it's, it is interesting when you look, listen to our Holy Father when he says, the reason I want Catholics to study the scriptures is so that they might have a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. He's using those very words, which links mm -hmm. us to our evangelical brothers and sisters. We, we can talk the same language here because our Holy Father is, is affirming what Catholics have always believed but didn't quite use the terms as of late. But now we're doing fathering our Holy Father. And now you're studying to be a deacon. Yes, yes. And, and folks that have been after me for that for years and uh, some saying, you know, oh, I thought you were a deacon or why aren't you a deacon or when are you going to be a deacon? And I always 
so I thought not yet, not now, or you know, if it, for whatever reason I felt that the time was right. And uh, so we just, my wife and I just finished the year of aspirancy and have been accepted, you know, uh, haven't had the formal installation yet, but we have four years of study to go and then we'll see where the Lord leads with that. All right, Mark. Well, thank you for sharing with us on this program. Uh, we've got a lot of people that watch it out there still looking for their church. And I think your own journey will give them a encouragement to listen to what the church says about herself, right? Yes. That's what you're saying. So thanks, Mark. Thank you. And God bless you and your work as a deacon. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this journey of the, this episode of the journey home. I hope Mark's journey is an encouragement to you to follow our Lord Jesus and his church in its fullness. God bless you. See you next week.